the clock starts ticking when they give you the quote, not when you sign the contract. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running and managing an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often because you have a mission, you have a purpose, and if the business is getting in the way, that's just keeping you from getting your purpose out into the world. Now, if you haven't already watched our 60 Minute From Owner Masterclass, highly encourage you, go, what are you waiting for? Go check that out. We've distilled over a decade plus of research uh, on the ground experience into this 60 Minute From Owner Masterclass about how you can use the smart practice method, principles and frameworks in your small architectural practice. Today, speaking of following your passion and your dreams, I'm just overjoyed and super excited to welcome back to the podcast one of our guests that we had all the way back in May of 2016. So episode 157 was with Victor Cavandias. He is the owner and principal of Building Ingenuity Architecture and Design. And he was originally on the podcast because he had participated in a business competition, architectural business competition, where he he laid out his his vision of creating an architect-led development company. Now, at the time, he didn't have land. It was nothing more than a vision and a dream. So I'm going to let you know what he's done since then. So he just finished his first development project. So he's coming back here to report on it. Super glad he reached out. He's based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, has been practicing since 2004, and has done a variety of different projects, uh, everything from residential, commercial, to parking garage design. He's also an expert and does consulting in building information modeling and is providing those services since 2015. As I mentioned before, Victor is passionate about architect-led real estate development and recently finished his first development project, which we're here to talk about today. And he believes fervently that the architect-led development business model opens up more opportunity and control for architects over their project and design outcomes. This is something that, you know, I was, when I went to the AI conference, I think it was back in 2018, I was at the AI conference and one of the largest sessions there was the session by Jonathan Siegel, who is the San Diego-based architect developer. Um, All the architects were just loving it. They all wanted to know how they could fire the clients. No disrespect to our clients, or maybe just a little bit of disrespect. Um, But they wanted to figure out how they could be their own clients. So Victor's ahead of the wave. You know, he had this dream over, as the time of this recording, it's over seven years ago that he first appeared on the podcast, uh, just over seven years ago. So Victor, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thanks for having me, Enoch. Well, let's take it. So beautiful. This interview is going to center around the development project that you just launched. Uh, We do have a video that you shared with us. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to play this video. Uh, Apologies to those who are listening on the podcast. You'll have to head over to YouTube to actually see the video. But this will be for those of you who watch this podcast episode on video. So let's cue that. And here we go. One, two, three. So there's the project. And for those who weren't able to view it because you're listening on the podcast, Victor, if you could just walk us through, just um, talk about the project. What's the size of it? Give us a a description of it so those who are listening can understand and get the visual picture in their mind since we are visual. Before I answer that, I just wanted, you know, to give a shout out to Jonathan Siegel. We actually just had him at um, AIA Fort Lauderdale, which is uh, the AIA chapter I'm uh, part of. And he presented his, um, his work, his best work and stuff for Architecture Fair Week. And a lot of the principles I executed on this were based on his teachings, you know, so um, I had the, the, you know, the benefit to have dinner with him. So he's a great guy and love his work. 
Yeah, um, and on that, uh, for listeners, go check out one of our very first interviews was with Jonathan Siegel. So search for Jonathan Siegel Business of Architecture podcast, and you can hear the incredible uh, interview that he did on the podcast. Victor, back to you. Yeah, so th this project, you know, I bought a vacant lot back in 2016 with my parents. Um, they were my silent business partners. Uh, we went 50-50 on this. Um, <clears throat> and I bought it in a neighborhood that was kind of, you know, it, it wasn't the best neighborhood, um, but it was transitioning. Uh, and it's near the art district in Fort Lauderdale. It's only five minutes from downtown. Uh, and, and, you know, I did a lot of research on this, on this property. I did a pro forma, a market analysis, you know, and, and I kind of determined the type of renters, because this is a for rent property, that I would get in this building. Uh, because the school district that it, it goes to is not uh, the best school district. The school's not rated well. So I was like, you know, I'm not going to get families here. And, and I got two tenants now, and it's exactly what I didn't get. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to get more professionals that are young, you know, working downtown, you know, um, young couples. And that's pretty much what I got. So I, I, my research paid off well there, you know, and, um, you know, so I designed the duplex kind of to cater to that audience, even though, you know, anybody could rent it. But I because I figured that that's the, uh, the target market that would rent it. Um, it's a three bedroom, two and a half bath. Uh, two units. So each unit is three bedroom, sorry, three bedroom, three and a half baths and uh, about 1700 square feet, no garage. Um, and, um, and the reason I did no garage is because I, I kind of felt like the garage wastes a lot of space and I it didn't feel like it benefited much and I could get more uh, under air conditioned square, square footage. Uh, by taking out the garage. So I just gave them a driveway and I gave them more back in the house. So the, out, the, the apartments actually feel larger than they actually are. It's not that big of a building, but because I took out the garage, I added like 200 square feet of actual living space. Um, How many square feet is each unit? 1,700. That's right. You said that 1,700 square feet. Yeah. And I'm curious with uh, taking out the garage or not including a garage, did you do any other com comparative market research on this or maybe some research on renters and find out what they wanted or was it just a gut feel? It was kind of a gut feel. Um, it was more of an architect design decision. You know, um, I just felt like there was more value added taking the garage because the thing is, is the code in Fort Lauderdale doesn't allow you to do a two car garage on each side. They, they have a, 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 a they change their neighborhood codes where they want more passive security. So they don't allow you to just do the whole facade parking garage. I mean, a garage door. They want um, living room windows and the entrance to be up front. So because of that, when you put a garage, you actually end up getting a long hallway and you end up having a lot of corridor space. And when I designed this, I wanted to minimize walking space. It's a very efficient, compact design. Almost all the walking space is part of a space. So, you know, and that's how I made the, uh, the units feel bigger. Um, so I just decided, you know what, I'm only gonna get one car in it anyway. And I'm probably going to get roommates and they're going to be fighting over the garage. So I just took it out. You know what I mean? So, and I figured couples, it's only going to fit one car. So, you know what? I took it out, gave them back more storage in, in form of closets. The second floor is two master, mirroring master bedrooms. You know, so that's what's a little different. It's not one master bedroom and then subsidiary rooms. It's two mirroring master bedrooms on the second floor um, with walk-in closets, um, a, a nice shower with two shower heads and each each bedroom has its own balcony which is sizable enough to put a coffee table and four and four chairs beautiful great so now we, we understand kind of the size of it uh the stylistic the language of the describe the language of the actual architecture to us so if, if people are familiar with south florida um the the architecture town here it's either mediterranean or it's very modern it's very white so i went with the more modern uh white feel um, and I wanted to incorporate some landscape, uh, you know, to um, give more curb appeal. So I actually built in some planters onto the facade um, and used that for lighting and, and, and to kind of frame the windows. Um, but it, it, if you look at the, the duplex, it's got a unique look because it almost looks like a face with angry teeth on each side. But, you know, that's how I see it. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and even though I valued engineered it severely because my original design would have probably made magazines with the, I was going to put artistic metal panels on it because I wanted to pay homage to the local art, art district. And I was going to have an artist put metal panels on each unit that were going to light up. 
And it's just that, you know, it just wasn't working for my first project. It just, you really, as an architect and developer, you have to keep it simple on your first project. And I learned that through design as I was starting to do the, uh, the uh, cost estimates. So I took out a lot of the fluff, but it still came out to be one of the nicest buildings on the block, even with the value engineering. Absolutely. Definitely increases the look of the neighborhood. So, well, let's walk through the finances of the project. So you, you purchased the lot. Uh, with your parents and what was the what was the price that you paid for the lot so at the time we actually got um fleeced you know uh, oh wow yeah yeah so it, it, but looking hindsight with where the market is now we actually got a steal you know because mm. i waited i got lucky I, I i executed it at the right time i thought during the process it was the worst time because i just saw things ballooning out of control and i was getting um i was getting cost increases left and right from the contractor and i'm just like oh my god but what, what helped me out is that I did several appraisals during the process, which allowed me to then gauge the progress of the project. You know, so I ended up um, getting an appraisal that showed me towards the end, like, wow, you know, this worked out. The price, the market value went just as high as the market increases in costs. So it worked out and I was able to get a construction loan pretty easily. Um, but the, the lot cost us 120 at the time. It was a vacant lot. Um, it probably was worth maybe 75 K, uh, at the mm -hmm. time in 2016. Did you know that at the time? No, I actually did some after the fact research and I was like, oh man, we overpaid. But okay. now well, tell me about that. Tell me why, why'd you overpay? Did you not do the research up front? Yeah, I, I didn't uh, do the, I, I, I wasn't experienced enough to, to, to haggle that down. You know, okay. I, I just, you know, and listen, it still, it still worked out because I was just like, this is a great neighborhood. This is one of the only vacant lots, and I just thought it was a steal. So I, I we went, we we paid cash, which was important, um, and you know, hindsight now, if you buy the lot now, it probably costs you like two fifty. Yeah, right? I mean, it's so great. Okay, so and you said you went fifty fifty with that with on your with your parents. Correct. So your parents contributed about sixty k. You contributed about sixty k. Correct. Cool. And if you don't mind me asking, where'd you come, where'd you come up with the 60 K for your, your portion? So at the time, you know, I, I was, I was, you know, um, single, I was in my early thirties. Uh, I actually, you know, made a sacrifice and I actually moved in with my parents for a year and just saved up my money. Um, and, 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 and I, I did that with the goal that I want to do my first, like, I was just how passionate I was about this concept. Like, you know, and, and it, when I submitted for the competition, I was already in the process. I was already living with my parents at that time, just saving up my money. And I had a pretty good career at that time. Uh, I was working for a firm and I was, you know, I was making six figures already, you know, so a lot of money just went into the bank. You know, not a lot of people have that privilege to do that, but if you do, that's a way to do it, you know, and I did it and it allowed me to save up enough money to at least go half with my parents. Okay, beautiful. So you, you bought the land. Now the land's sitting there. Uh, how much time passed between that? Tell us the process though. Next step, you have the land that's sitting there. What happened next? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I just held on to the land because I wasn't ready um, financially yet to, to move forward. Um, and, um, and, and I was doing my research slowly. I was calling lenders, just kind of getting a gauge of how much money I need to put down. And, you know, not every lender recognizes, you know, like Jonathan Siegel calls it Johnny Bucks. Not every lender recognizes that. They don't, they don't always recognize your design services as part of the um, down payment. So I had to call around to find a lender and, and it was hard for me because I was a rookie developer and I'll just tell her right now, no, they don't care that you're an architect. Doesn't matter. If you haven't done development, you're a rookie. It doesn't matter if you've done CA, they don't care. You know what I mean? So. Um, I thought that would make a difference. It didn't. They, you know what they actually would value if you were a contractor, but I'm not a contractor. So being an architect doesn't help, but if you call around and you, and you do enough research, you will find lenders that will recognize the architectural services and, and you could put a value to it and then they'll accept it. You know, so then you do get to use your Johnny bucks, but not all of them do, which is weird because if I hired another architect, they would recognize it. And if I paid the architect, oh, they like show the receipt. But the minute they say, oh, I'm doing it myself, then they don't want to recognize it. I'm like, well, why? You know? So I just had to find the right lender that obviously I could talk sense into and they understood that. So, you know. And was, and I, it, was it a national bank? Was it a local bank, a local credit union, a private equity lender, no, uh, was, hard money? It was, it was a private lender. 
And cr- believe it or not, I was a private lender out of California. Really? Um, yeah. They're called Center Street Lending. Um, I could not get a local lender in Florida for the life of me. And the reason why is because where I'm from, South Florida, it is the capital of fraud. And they just are allergic to lending money for this kind of stuff just because of the amount of fraud that goes on. So I had to actually find a lender not in Florida that was willing to take a chance. You know, and obviously I paid a high interest rate. My interest rate was, a, I think, a 10.5% starting you know, on my construction loan. And with, and you know, and I had several delays, which we'll get into in the construction process. So I had to ask for um, increases to the schedule and renewing the loan, which increased my interest rate all the way up to 12% at one point, you know, so, um, but uh, yeah, so. How, how did you find that, that lender? Was it a referral from someone? You found them on the internet, you talked to another developer. How'd you find them? Believe it or not, Instagram, you know. Wow, you, tell me about you know, that. How'd you find them on Instagram? So no, no, the Instagram found me, you know what I mean? Because you know how uh, Big Brother is always listening to you. Um, so, you know, obviously uh, my Facebook, I mean, my um, cell phone was listening on me saying, hey, I need a loan for construction. So all of a sudden Center Street Lending showed up on Instagram. Obviously I didn't change my settings so that my phone isn't listening to my, all my conversations, but uh, advertisements for Center Street Lending showed up. I was like, oh, let me check them out. You know, I gave them a call and you know, I, I must've called at least 10 lenders. And they were the ones that gave me the best vibe. And so I went with them. Okay, beautiful. So let's see, how about how much time are we talking here from when you purchased the land to when you actually got this loan, construction loan lined up? So I purchased the land in 2016 and I got the financing in at the end of 2020. I started the design in, you know, I was kind of just doing things slowly on the side. Uh, I started the design in 2018 changed the design like three times. Uh, you know, I'm an architect, so you know, I, I did that. Um, and finally, when I landed on a design I was comfortable with, um, but I mean, one of the reasons why the design changed was because the city of Fort Lauderdale actually changed their code for um, small mixed, mixed, I mean, small multifamily, you know, two to four units. They changed, they made a code specifically for duplexes, quadplexes, and and triplexes that changed as I was designing. So my first design then didn't meet the code. So then I had to change it to meet that code. What was and different that, in that first design? Uh, well, you know, I guess, you know, a lot of developers were building duplexes with garages that basically took up the whole facade. And you would, you would come in from the side. And what that was doing, it was creating neighborhoods where there was no passive security, no eyeballs on the street because the garages fronted the, the units. So the streets, the, the, the neighbors and the, you know, the citizens took, you know, went up to the city and said, hey, we need to change the design because nobody's looking at the street and this is causing unsafe neighborhoods. So they changed the code so that there's passive security. People who are living in the units can actually, when they're in their living room, they can see out to the street, see who's walking around and stuff. And that caused for the ability to put a two-car garage and a duplex on a 50-foot um, lot, almost impossible. So, which was one of the reasons why I took the garage out, you know, because I just didn't feel like, unless it was a two-car garage, it wasn't adding much value to the design. So I was just like, it's taking up too much space and it's not allowing me to put more than one car. So I'm taking it out. So you got, you, you locked in the lending in 2020. When in 2020 was, did you get it? I, I, at the end of 2020, um, I was, you know, working with contractors that, you know, I, I, I've worked with during my design um, uh, experience and um, I ended up going with a contractor FH construction um, cash Falazade is a buddy of mine and I went with him because he was being very flexible with me and he was giving me cost estimate after cost estimate I would change the design tweak it you know and he would continue to give me cost estimate because he really wanted the project so he was working with me and I, he must have gave me like five cost estimates and that meant a lot to me because it allowed me to get the project to where I was comfortable with the cost and so I went with him and, and it, it was a good decision because he was very flexible with me, worked with me, you know, I, there was some hiccups in the design and during the construction process, you know, and, and then, you know, market conditions hit cause you know, with COVID and everything happening, the, the price of materials just skyrocketed. I, I ended up, you know, the cost of the project initially was about 900 grand. 
and it balloons to uh, about 100, uh, 100K more. I got a $75,000 change order just on drywall, um, mechanical, and paint. Those three units, those three materials um, just went out of control. And I, when I saw that change order, I, my heart just like came out of my chest. I was like, oh, I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I had a, I had a 10% um, contingency and that just blew my contingency out of the water. And never mind, I had some small things here and there from design errors that I, you know, my contingency covered, um, but not that. So I had to, I mean, you know, between me and my parents, we had to come out of our pocket, dip into savings a little more to cover that, you know, and, and listen, the project, okay. almost, the project almost broke us financially, but we got there through the skin of our teeth. Uh, we were able Man. to make it work and, um, you know, uh, is a lot more than I anticipated, but you know, it ended up costing a little over a million to finish. Um, you know, but at, without those market price increases, I'm happy to say that my contingency actually would have covered the air er minor errors I made on the project, but not with the market increases. It, it definitely, I, I had to come out of pocket. Hey, when COVID was happening, so I mean, tail end of 2020, we were still in that, we were deep in the mix with COVID. Did you have that? Did you find that uh, the lenders that was influencing the conversation, making it more difficult? What was the impact of the whole COVID scenario on getting financing for the project? Uh, not really, not that much. Um, you know, I mean, obviously everything was done virtually. So I was just talking on the phone and I never met my lender. My lender was out of California, you know, so everything was on the phone over the internet. Um, so it didn't have much of an impact. Um, and you know, it, I would say zero, I would say the only thing COVID impacted was the price increases because you know, as when COVID shut everything down, that's when the cost of materials like steel and wood just skyrocketed because everything shut down. So because of COVID, I got hit with that monstrous change order, you know? So I would say that was the impact of COVID, just the cost increases on materials because of bottlenecks in the shipping and supplies. Let me mention, the, my contractor explained to me what happened was because of COVID and the surge of, you know, people wanting homes because all of a sudden the real estate industry just caught fire because people wanted to buy homes. What happened was the big cookie cutter developers, you know, like Lennar and stuff, they purchased in bulk drywall, wood, and they just hoarded it all for themselves so that they could have enough material to build and meet this demand. And what that caused was a lack of supply for small developers like me because the big developers were getting priority. So they were actually the cause. You know, all the big developers just hoarded everything. And I, you know, honestly, I'm surprised it only cost a hundred grand extra. I think it, it's not unseeable that it would have cost 200 grand extra knowing how much things were, were skyrocketing at the time. I got lucky. Definitely, you know, luck on your first project does play a part. So, you know, uh, that's all I got to say on that one. Well, let's talk about what are, let's talk about the key lessons that you learned from doing this project. Uh, first of all, walk me through the timeline. So you closed on the contract uh, on the, the financing. So this is a construction loan, which means that they're the ones who provide the funds for you to buy the materials, uh, fund the, fund the project, pay the contractor, et cetera. And, um, yeah, what was, what was, so you broke ground, t talk to like, walk us through the project, how long it took mistakes that happened, lessons learned, give us the whole play by play. Spiel. Yeah, so the key thing here is when I was getting my, my financing, I didn't have to put any money down uh, because they recognized the money I put on the, the lot, all of the money from my design fees. And I charge design fees in this case for my architecture, for interior design, and for development. I put design fees in there as, for myself as a developer doing due diligence and stuff like that. So I put in just in equity, sweat equity, I probably put in about 45, 50K, I can't remember exactly, but of money, which was a good chunk of the, cause you know, the, the down payment was probably about a little like 230K. So 50K of that 230 was sweat equity money from my designing. And then also they recognize all the money I paid to my engineers, you know, oh, I also did the plumbing and electrical myself, so I charged for that. You know, I wasn't comfortable doing the mechanical, so I, I subbed that out. But, um, you know, I, I had a civil, a landscape architect, structural engineer, you know, paid all of them, so that all counted. You know, and obviously there were some permitting fees thrown in there. So all, they recognized all that um, money that I spent 
and that so then I didn't have to pay any more money. That was my down payment. So I got my loan, and the loan. Oh, basically, well, hold on, bear, bear, bear with me. So the down payment ended up being how much? About two hundred thirty k. Yeah, yeah. Did you say okay, cool? And there, you didn't have to come up with any money out of pocket to to finance that. That was did they count the land cost as part of that? Yes, yeah, that was the majority of it. The one. Okay, so land cost plus your your architectural fees. So no, yeah. no money out of pocket. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, you know the ar the architectural and engineering fees came out to about eighty k. You know, fifty for myself and then thirty for the consultants. You know, um, and then uh, and obviously there were permitting fees and stuff like that. So you know, then I and they financed one hundred percent of the construction, which was great. Um, so at that time, the project appraised at one point two. So that was what the construction loan was based off of. Um, so we went from in that in that direction. Construction started at the end of 2020, um, and and I got I ended up getting my permit right after that. And you know, it was originally scheduled to be an eight a nine month project. It was supposed to be done at the end of September. It didn't finish until May of this year. So it actually got delayed by more than six months. And it that. I would tell you that I probably paid an extra 40 to 50 K in, in, in construction interest that I wasn't anticipating. And it was due to delays because of the city. I had big issues with the city and it was due to a design error that my, um, you know, my civil engineer made, um, that I was not aware of. Um, and the thing is, is that because of COVID, the city was going through a lot of turnover. So the people who approved my project as a duplex, um, were no longer employed there. So then the inspectors who were brand new people came in with a fresh set of eyes and then realized during construction, hey, you know what, this, this doesn't meet code to be a duplex. This is actually a two family dwelling. And I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? And you know, my sewer infrastructure was already tied in everything. And it literally 75% complete, they decided to throw that curveball at me. And it was crazy because, you know, my I had to be finished in like two months. My construction loan was expiring in two months and they were telling me it's not a duplex and I had to change everything because that was a big, that's a big deal because that affects the financing because, you know, I appraised the project as a duplex, two units separately sold two townhomes. And I appraised it as a duplex, which is one building on one lot, not separated. And the cost difference was a lot. So I, I'll tell you right now, the project, at the end of the project, ended up appraising at two point five, no, um, two million forty thousand. It so it, it went from one point two to two million forty thousand as during construction. That's how much it increased in value. It was crazy, um, but that was as two townhomes. As a single fa two family dwelling, it actually appraised at one point five five. So you see the cost and diff the interest, the, the difference in value just because of the lots being separated, no change in the design, very little change in design, just that little nuance because of comps changed the value by 500 K. So what ended up happening, because I, I, I wanted to fix the problem when they brought it to me and my contractor gave me a change order of 6K to fix the problem. I said, great, I'm just going to drop the 6K, fix the problem. However, the and what, city what did they pause for a second? What did what's the difference in their code language between a two family dwelling versus a duplex? Like what is the what made it a, a, a two family dwelling instead of a duplex? A duplex is two separate units independently separated. So two townhomes on two lots. So you had to separate the lots, which I did. But the problem was my civil engineer, when he came out with the um, sanitary he tied the sanitary together in the middle of the lot before it got to the public infrastructure. And to be a duplex, each has to have its own tap, separate. And the thing is, I have actually designed several duplexes in Fort Lauderdale that way. My civil engineers have done it that way and the city let it go. But they just started policing that recently and I got caught in when they decided to start policing that. So, you know, I was, one of, the, I was one of the first developers hit with the new rules and it, you know, if they had told me that during permitting, I would have told my civil engineer, let's fix it. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I guess you didn't, you didn't d decide to dig it up. It, well, that wasn't possible dig it up and retie it in. No, I was ready to do it. But then when I went back to the city, the engineering department told me they needed six months to re-review my project 
and give me the permit in order to approve it. And I was like, I don't have six months. I have my, my construction loan ends in two, two months. Hindsight being 2020, they delayed my project because of this issue by almost seven months. I would have even taken the six months delay had I known that they were going to delay my project by seven months over this issue, you know? So, you know, and, and the thing is, is I, I considered, you know, going after the city, city legally and everything. And, you know, attorneys I spoke to said I had a case. They, they called it um, estoppel or something like, I don't know, something. They had a technical term for it, but they said that, you know, I would have won this, but it, it, I would have been in court for years fighting the city and I just didn't have that money. So I just caved and I gave in. But I got lucky that the project appraised so much that even as a two family dwelling, I was able to get the financing, the mortgage and cover everything. So it was luck because if, if the project didn't increase that much in value, I probably would have lost it. I probably, it would have been a failed project for me. Wow. So and what was the stress that you were going, as this was happening, man, what, what, how are you feeling? What was the, the stress or lack thereof? Or were you just like, I got this under control, no big deal. Were you sweating bullets? What was it like emotionally? No, it was very stressful because, you know, I mean, it wasn't until I got that appraisal where I saw, oh my God, the value has increased so much more. Um, but based on the last appraisal I got, I wasn't going to be able to get a, a mortgage to cover the costs. And I was going to be short, maybe like two, 300 K and I didn't have that money. So I was like, this is not going to work. You know, so it was, it was stressing me out a lot because, you know, I had not done an appraisal in a while. And I would say that's one of the lessons learned is you want to pay to do appraisals multiple times just to kind of have a gauge of where your project's at because it, things change in a year, you know. So that last appraisal I did before I when I was trying to get my mortgage um, financing to get, exit the construction loan was was the breadwinner for me because I got it. I was like, oh, my God, my project's worth two million, a million each unit. It went from 450 each unit to a million each unit. And and the, the appraiser was like, you you design a product. And this is where being an architect paid off because the, the appraiser was like, you design a product that's like none other. And it's like I had to really reach to find and they put a lot of, you know, um, bonuses in the value because of what I've, I did with the design because they're just like, there's nothing that compares to your project. It's a unique project. So being unique actually paid off for me because um, I, I did things that other developers want to do. I was trying to do something unique because I'm an architect. Like, I don't want to do everything every Joe Schmo developer is doing. Let me do something different. So I took a little risk there and that risk actually paid off. And, you know, it, that helped. But I still plan on repairing the issue. So I went to the city after um, I got my tenants and I sent them an email. I'm like, look, after I get my CO, can I repair the issue? Can I tear up my driveways and repair the issue? They said, yeah, you can. And then I said, and then I can qualify it as a duplex. They said, yes, you can. So it's going to cost me maybe like 80K to fix the problem. After the fact, it would have been 6K if I did it during construction. Now it's going to cost me 80K because I got to demolish the driveway, rip up the landscaping, put the plumbing in. And never mind, I'm going to have to not have tenants while I do it for, for about a month or so, you know, so, but the project appraised 500 K more as two separate units. So it's worth it. Yeah. Were you able to take out any cash when you did the mortgage or is that what you hope to do when you do that reappraisal and uh, take out another mortgage? No, I, I did. I did a cash out, um, refinance. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I had to pay the contractor for all the change orders. So, um, I, I was able to get an, enough cash, almost enough cash to basically pay the ch contractor on the extra um, cost that my construction loan didn't cover because I owed the contractor like 120 k more uh, okay. in money. And, and that had a lot to do with the fact that the city delayed my project so much because I had to pay my construction lender maybe another extra f like 50 k in interest that I didn't need to pay had the project completed on time. And that 50 k would have went towards the extra money I owed the contractor. So, you know, I really had to scrape funds at the end because of the city holding me up. And, and there was one point where the city didn't want to recognize the signatures of one of my engineers and they held up the project for like a, almost a month and a half because they didn't believe that my engineer actually hand signed the project. And I had to submit over and over and over again just to get them to say, hey, it's a, a wet signature. It's not digital. You know, and it's just like, come on, guys, you're costing me tens of thousands of dollars over something. So and it was my last comment. It was my last comment to get my CEO. So I was getting very frustrated with the city. 
So the total amount you took out with the, the cash out refinance, how much did you end up taking out? I got a, a, a mortgage of about a million sixty five. So that was enough for me to basically pay off my contractor and also pay my fees because, you know, they obviously I had to pay the, the, the lender for the mortgage to about 40 K, you know, and close out fees and stuff. So that covered that, too. So I didn't actually have to come out of pocket, but I ended up being short about 20 K. Uh, to the contractor, so I'm paying that off to the and the contractor. You know, since we do work together, he 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 agreed to um, to do a payment plan with me. So I'm I'm paying him per month until the end of the year to cover that 20k, and and then I'm good. Man, hustling! I love it. I love it. So the cash out. So what's your what's your mortgage payment now on this property? So the mortgage payment is about seven thousand um, six hundred. Okay. But my, my rents are 4,650 each unit. Wow. So, and you know, what's crazy is that, you know, when I got my real estate agent to rent it out, my project rented out literally in three days. I put it on the market, gone in three days. Amazing. You know, and, that, and that was because there's, there's not enough supply right now, you know? So if you make a product it, right now, if you made a product, it's selling or it's renting because there's just not enough. People are still fighting over your product. And, and the reality was, my real estate agent said, you're not going to be able to rent these for more than 41 each side, 4,100. And I said, well, let's put them on the market for 4,650 and let's see what happens. They rented in three days at that price. And the reality is when I, when I went to my mortgage lender, they said, they appraised the project themselves and they said, we think you undercharged. We think each unit should have been over 5k. So wow. I, they actually, they actually dinged me for that because my debt to service ratio didn't, didn't, work out. So they actually ended up charging me another 20 K in fees to bring down the interest rate. And that's basically the 20 K that I owe the contractor now. So, and that hit me, that was like literally the day before I signed, I got hit with an extra, another extra 20 K in fees. I wasn't expecting. So I was just like, Jesus, come on, you know? So. Yeah. So um, those, those were, was those points that they added to bring down the interest rate you said? Mm -hmm. Got it. And they wanted to bring down the interest rate. Why to bring down your payment? Mm -hmm. yeah. to make the debt to service ratio work. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So how does that, how does that, how does that rent 4,600 or 4,650? How does that compare with other properties uh, generally that you're competing with in the area? Is it more? Is it less? Is it about, about the same? You know, so no, it's, it's about, yeah, it's about the same. Uh, right now rent's really high. Um, and um, that neighborhood, it's, I would say it's gentrifying right now. Um, it's next to an art district that is also changing. If, if you guys are familiar with an art district in Miami called Wynwood, that was a warehouse district that then turned into a artsy fartsy, lots of artists there. And, and then it became hip clubs. And then it was like the, the place to go if you wanted to see like artwork from a local artists and, you know, also famous artists, you know, whenever they do um, Art Basel, it's done in that area. Uh, and then the developers swooped in and now Wynwood's become this like um, other downtown and, and all, all the artists are gone now because they can't afford the rents. So, you know, that's how it happened. So our, Fort Lauderdale has a little district that not as big as Miami's, but that was doing the same. And now just literally uh, in the last week, they tore down all of the warehouses that had artists and now big skyscrapers are going there, you know, but. So, but I, the thing is, is that when I bought the property, one of the things that I, I did research on was I looked at where the city of Fort Lauderdale, what were they doing in the next five to 10 years? I wanted to be in a neighborhood where it was close to some big ambitious developments that were coming. And then I, I, I heard about a development called Sears town that now just got approved and it's like uh, three high rises and it's going to be a huge mall. It's literally two blocks away from my property. And I knew about that project years in advance. And I'm like, I want to be next to that because that's going to change everything. And, you know, and the thing is my project has appraised in value before that has actually been built. So that's going to be done in the next couple of years. And, you know, who knows how much my project is going to be worth because it's literally walking distance from the edge of downtown now. Um, downtown has creeped closer and closer and closer to my neighborhood. So we're basically now the neighborhood where I bought in is the first neighborhood outside of one of the borders of downtown. Well done. Well done.
Yeah. So what other lessons did you learn from doing this development project? So, okay. So one of the lessons I learned was it doesn't always pay to do your own um, buying materials and, and doing your own construction in the project. So to save money, I took some scope away from the contractor and I was like, you know what, I'm going to build my own vanities, my mill, I'm going to do the mill work myself, you know, and I thought I was saving money, but it actually ended up becoming more of a headache for me. And then what happened was I had a lot of issues and obviously I took it out of the contractor's scope. So the contractor's like, oh, not my problem. You know what I mean? So I was like, crap, you know, it's my problem, you know? So, and you know, I don't do that stuff often. So, you know, it was, it was brand new for me to deal with those issues. Uh, and, and then also I ordered, let me tell you, Working with Home Depot is a nightmare. I would recommend when you're doing your first development, go with some local um, suppliers because they're going to be more receptive. They're going to be more catering to you and they will fix the issues that you have faster. With Home Depot, you buy something and then you got to go through so much red tape. If it's, I, I had to order my washer and dryer three times. My tenants moved in before I had a, washer, a functioning washer and dryer. And I had ordered my, wa my washer and dryer two months ahead before they moved in. And I still didn't get it in time because Home Depot kept de delivering me uh, malfunctioning washer and dryers. And then dealing with their customer service was a nightmare. Uh, I was cursing at their customer service. I was so frustrated. You know, so that's one of the things I learned is you, you want to uh, work with more local uh, suppliers because they'll they'll be more attentive to your concerns and they'll work faster and you, you don't got to jump through hoops just to talk to somebody you know and the mistakes were actually made by Home Depot's own salespeople because the first time I ordered a washer and dryer my washer and dryers were actually working but then the delivery person didn't want to deliver because the salesperson put my duplex as one unit rather than two separate units and the delivery person's like, I can't deliver. You got two separate addresses in one order. I can't do this. So then I, wouldn't, I couldn't get my washer and dryer just because of that mistake that the salesperson made. And then trying to get another order, it was just, it was weeks of hassle, you know? And, and I know that if I had worked with somebody more local, I wouldn't have to go through that. So, and then I also got vanities that were, were damaged and through Home Depot, you know, they get damaged through delivery. You know, so it's not, and, and then the vanities I ordered were, were low in stock too. So I actually ended up installing vanities with cracks. They weren't pristine like I wanted them to be because by the time the tenants moved in, I couldn't find another replacement vanity of the same time because I bought something so unique that they had such a low stock. And that's another lesson learned is that, you know what, when, when, when I'm ordering stuff, I want to order something that has high stock, not something so unique that it's going to be a problem for me to reorder it. Um, you know, contractors know this, but I didn't because I'm an architect. You know, I don't order stuff all the time. So, you know, those were some lessons learned. Um, some design lessons I learned, um, you know, and, and, you know, and this, I only learned this because I was developing my own projects. I want to keep you want to keep the plumbing away from where you do the mill work because, and this was also because I was installing my own mill work, you know, I was screwing into the walls and there was pipes there and, and, and you know, I had to use a stud finder trying to find the pipes to make sure I didn't penetrate through the pipes had I just not put the pipes in the same wall where I had wall hung vanities or mill work, you know, I had, I would have, you know, avoided that stress, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, th th there, there were things like that that I learned, but the biggest lessons learned uh, also with getting the financing. Here's a big lesson I learned when I got the construction financing. The clock starts ticking when they give you the quote, not when you sign the contract. So what happened was I got my quote and I, I was still shopping around. So I sat on the quote for like a month and a half, not knowing that the clock was already ticking on the construction schedule for, from their end, from the lender's end. So then what I thought I had a year, by the time I actually broke ground, I only had 10 months, you know, because the clock was ticking when they gave me the, um, the loan rate, not when I signed the contract. And I didn't know that, you know, so that's some, that's key because if, you know, that they start hitting you with the higher interests when you have to extend the construction schedule. So those, those were the key, 
you know, I would say lessons learned as a developer, you know, as an architect is that it's not always best to do your own construction unless you, you have good experience in it. And listen, I, I did took some risk on some things being a first time developer and, you know, um, it worked out, but I was very frustrated. I could tell you that. Um, so I, I would say that that was uh, definitely a lesson learned. What's next for building ingenuity? So, you know, my, my concept, you know, for building ingenuity always has been, you know, and this was pitched in the business uh, plan competition, was that this was going to be um, a, uh, a concept where I develop and I become more like a shark tank investor and I'm going to teach other architects and, and then also mentor them through the process, hold them hand, by, hand in hand and help them develop and become an investor with them. And, you know, I look at myself almost as a shark because I know the business, kind of like the sharks who, you know, they put in bids, they know their business, you know, so they, they put in bids on businesses that they know about that they're, you know, like Mark Cuban and stuff, you know, they're like, oh, I understand that business, I can help you out. So that's how I feel. It's like, you know, I understand this. I'm an architect, I'm a developer. I can help other architects do that. So, you know, in, in the near term, I'm gonna help other architects go through it, kind of coach them. You know, kind of like the way Jonathan Siegel does, except I'm going to be more hands-on. Jonathan Siegel, he kind of has like a website. I'm going to actually be coaching them and going to going with them to the properties and being one-on-one -on -one and being with them throughout the project. You know, um, that's 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 where I'm going to be going um, short-term, but long-term. You know, I still plan on franchising this business concept. Mm, beautiful. And uh, when do you plan to do your next development project? So. Um, I am, right now I'm in the process of buying my own home. Uh, so that's gonna be first. Uh, but then right after I close on my own home, then I'm going to look for another property. So I would say within the next um, year or two, I'm probably gonna buy another lot and I'm going to develop and, uh, you know, and, and, and start again on the process. And, and, you know, I'm probably gonna start doing the coaching, mentoring thing after um, two to three developments. And do you think that you'll follow the same kind of thought process with the new lot you build or were you going to take a different approach with the location, the size, et cetera? No, definitely. I'm going to tell you right now, biggest lesson I learned was I bit off a little more than I can chew uh, on my first project. Uh, I'm definitely going to try to, you know, do something a little smaller scale than my first project actually, because oh. um, like I said, I only got through it with luck. And you, can, you don't always have luck on your side, so I want to control the outcome a little bit. So I'm probably going to go a little smaller scale on the projects. I want the construction to cost to be more like six, seven hundred K versus a million, you know, because uh, that, that really, you know, uh, took a toll on my finances. But I, I, I still I made it out. And, you know, I may, I may be able to do the same project now because now I'll be able to take, pull out equity for my first project to finance the second project. So now I'm, I'm actually going to have a little bit more um, money and, uh, you know, be able to put a, lo a little more, more skin down. So I may be able to do the same project and be, it'll be a little bit less risky this time around. Beautiful. Well, Victor, thanks for coming on here to the business of architecture, man. So amazing to hear the update of where you've been and congratulations on doing this project, getting through it successfully, like you said, with a lot of grace on your side to make it through. It's beautiful. So where can people go to find out more about you, website, to, you know, about your consulting that you're going to be doing? Where can people follow you? So um, my website is buildingenuity.com, www.buildingenuity.com. That's my website, so you can see my work there. And I actually have a page focused on development where other architects could reach out to me and we can have a start a conversation. Uh, it is something I plan on helping out in the near future. Um, and I'm, I'm, I plan on setting up a course very soon. I'm going to do actually um, for AIA for Lauderdale, I'm going to set up, a, I'm going to be doing a um, a kind of a case study on this project and, and talking a lot about what I talked to you on the podcast, but in person showing slides and showing the project and, you know, running through everybody so they can understand what I went through as a, as a first time developer. Uh, I have YouTube, a YouTube page for building ingenuity. You could look up building ingenuity, architecture and design on YouTube, and you'll see videos of my projects, my customer testimonials, and you'll see my development project there. You know, um, you could follow me on Instagram at www, I mean, not www, uh, at build ingenuity. Um, and, you know, I also have a Facebook page. So I, I'm on all the, uh, you know, um, 
social media. Me and my wife, we're business partners together, so you'll see a lot of our work um, that we do. Uh, we do a lot of residential and commercial, so um, that's what you'll find on our website. All right. Victor, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Enoch. It was a pleasure. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.